Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we'll be discussing on perioperative hypothermia part 2. Methods of warming the patient Can be external methods and internal methods. Regarding external methods, passive insulation involves the use of a single layer of insulation such as a space blanket. A single layer of blanket may reduce cutaneous heat loss by 30% by trapping a layer of insulating air. Additional layers of blankets do not provide much additional heat insulation. Insulation to exposed areas such as wrapping the heat further reduces heat loss. Passive warming is effective only when the patient's own heat generating mechanisms are intact. Active external warming is more effective than passive insulation. This reduces heat loss through radiation and increases heat gain if forced air is warmer than the skin. Examples of external active warming includes forced air warming devices. This is one of the most effective means of warming a patient. It is best used preoperatively and intraoperatively to prevent hypothermia. Other examples of active warming includes circulating water mattress, electric mattresses, pads or blankets, and heated mattresses. Evidence for their superiority over forced air warming devices are limited. Regarding heated mattresses, these are not as effective as forced air warmers due to the smaller surface area of contact and minimal amount of heat loss into the foam insulation present on most OT tables. Heated mattresses risk tissue damage due to reduced local perfusion of the patient's body part in contact with the heated mattress. Internal warming methods Warming of inspired gases Normally, inspired air is warmed to 37 degrees Celsius and fully saturated at the isothermic saturation boundary at about 5 cm below the carina. Tracheal intubation moves the isothermic saturation boundary distally. Gases are delivered to parts of the respiratory tract that are less able to humidify them if they are dry. Heat loss occurs via latent heat of vaporization as dry anesthetic gases are humidified in the respiratory tract. Heat loss from warming cold inspired air is 2 watts per hour and heat loss from humidifying dry air is 8 watts per hour. Body power output during sleep in the typical adult is 80 to 100 watts per hour. Heat loss due to warming of cold, dry inspired gases can be significant, especially in children. After 90 minutes of ventilation with non-humidified gases, the core temperature of anesthetized children reduces by 0.75 degrees Celsius. Increasing the temperature of inhaled gases to 40 to 45 degrees Celsius can raise the core body temperature at the rate of 2.5 degrees Celsius per hour in intubated patients. Methods for warming inspired gases Heat and moisture exchange filter. This is widely used. It functions to humidify and warm inhaled gases. These devices contain hygroscopic material that attracts moisture from the atmosphere within a sealed unit. Water vapor condenses on the hygroscopic material when warm expired gases cool. The condensed water vapor is warmed by the specific heat of the exhaled gas and latent heat of vaporization of water. Dry cool gas inhaled is thus warmed during inspiration, during which process the element cools down prior to the next exhalation. HME filters cannot attain 100% efficiency as it is a passive method, but may achieve 70% efficiency. Disadvantages of HME filters include moderate inefficiency with prolonged use, increased dead space, airway resistance, and increased risk of infection. Circle systems Circle system is a rebreathing system widely used in anesthesia that has several advantages. Inspired gases are warm and humidified. It is economical. Circle systems are particularly useful for long cases because it conserves anesthetic gases, heat and moisture. There is minimal pollution as anesthetic gases are recycled. 
low flow anesthesia can be employed. There is low dead space, the mechanical dead space created by the Y-piece tubing between the patient and the unidirectional valves is no greater than that in non-rebreathing circuits. There is low risk of soda lime dust inhalation compared to water circuit as the soda lime canister is distant from the patient's airway. Soda lime Soda lime is the substance commonly used for CO2 absorption in rebreathing systems. The main purpose of soda lime is to allow the rebreathing of exhaled gases within breathing systems by absorbing exhaled CO2. It is originally used in the water circuit. Currently, it is used most commonly in circle systems. Large canisters containing up to 2 kg of soda lime are commonly employed. Composition of soda lime includes calcium hydroxide 81%, bound water 15%, sodium hydroxide 4%, Potassium hydroxide, less than 1% or nil. Potassium hydroxide was added as an accelerator, but this strong alkali has been implicated in the formation of carbon monoxide due to a reaction from isofluorine and fluorine or desfluorine and compound A due to a reaction from sevofluorine. Thus, potassium hydroxide has been removed by manufacturers from soda lime. Silica 0.2% Silica is added to produce calcium and sodium silicate, which in trace amounts harden the granules which otherwise would disintegrate into powder. The efficiency of CO2 absorption varies inversely with granule hardness. The absorption of CO2 by soda lime generates water and heat, which warms and humidifies inspired gases. The formula is CO2 plus H2O produces H2CO3, H2CO3 plus 2NaOH produces Na2CO3 plus 2H2O plus heat. Na2CO3 plus CaOH2 produces CaCO3 plus 2NaOH plus heat. The overall equation is CO2 plus CaOH2 produces CaCO3 plus H2O plus heat. Barra lime is another CO2 absorber used in circle systems. Composition is 20% barium hydroxide octahydrate and 80% calcium hydroxide. The absorption of CO2 by barra lime generates water and heat, which warms and humidifies gases. The formula is BaOH2 plus 8H2O plus CO2 produces BaCO3 plus 9H2O plus heat. 9H2O plus 9CO2 produces 9H2CO3. Then by direct reactions and by KOH or NaOH, 9H2CO3 plus 9CaOH2 produces CaCO3 plus 18H2O plus heat. Compared with soda lime, more water is liberated and less heat is generated when barium hydroxide reacts with CO2. For further details, kindly refer to the video on CO2 absorbers. Warm water bath. This is an active system. Dry gases bubbles through heated water at 60 degrees Celsius to inhibit microbial contamination. Efficiency is more than 90%. This is a complicated system. The risk of thermal injury to the patient is minimized by thermostats. The cascade humidifier is a variation on the warm water bath. Gas bubbles through a perforated plate which maximizes the surface area to which water is exposed. Warming of IV fluids. This reduces conductive heat loss secondary to administration of cold IV fluids. Active warming should be employed to pre-warm IV fluids, for example, by storage in a thermostatically controlled cabinet or warmed to 37 degrees Celsius by an active warming device, or by IV fluid infusions. Invasive internal warming techniques. This includes peritoneal lavage with heated fluids heated gastric, bladder or colon lavage. These have slower rates of increasing temperature due to a limited area for heat exchange. Closed or open thoracic lavage with warm saline or extracorporeal blood rewarming. The most efficient but most invasive method of rewarming is cardiopulmonary bypass. Core temperature can increase by 1 degree Celsius every 5 minutes. Other extracorporeal systems such as hemofiltration units, lack rapid flow rates. For example, veno-venous systems using counter-current blood warmers 
can increase core temperatures by 2 degrees Celsius per hour. Internal warming cardiopulmonary bypass and peritoneal dialysis are very effective at transferring significant heat. These are not employed in the management of mild perioperative hypothermia. For moderate to severe hypothermia, invasive internal warming techniques may be employed. Moderate to severe hypothermia may be due to environmental exposure, unintended perioperative hypothermia, or when a patient's body temperature is deliberately lowered as low as 15 degrees Celsius to allow specialized forms of surgery such as aortic arch replacement or cerebral aneurysm repair. Moderate and severe hypothermia require active rewarming. With regards to the rate of rewarming, there is some evidence to support rapid rewarming, particularly after rapid onset hypothermia. However, it is more usual to raise the core temperature gradually, for example, by 1 degree Celsius per hour. It is not possible to generalize about optimal warming rates as there are substantial differences depending on the clinical context. For example, in brain injured patients, rapid rewarming is associated with worse outcomes. Rewarming rates as low as 0.25 degrees Celsius an hour have been recommended for brain injured patients. A slow rate of rewarming is associated with problems as well. For example, persistent temperature variation between organs reperfusion injury, and rewarming shock. Rewarming from moderate or severe hypothermia is often accompanied by hypotension, a phenomenon known as rewarming shock. This is characterized by acute metabolic acidosis as the patient vasodilates too rapidly for the rate of fluid replacement. Rewarming shock is attributed to hypovolemia from cold diuresis, myocardial depression, and vasodilation. Volume infusion of heated fluids help to alleviate rewarming shock. Vessel presses are required in about 50% of patients with severe hypothermia, and its use indicates a poor prognosis. Strategies to minimize or prevent perioperative hypothermia. Pre-admission or pre-operative recommendations. First, Assess risk factors for perioperative hypothermia. Supported by strong evidence, none. Supported by weak evidence, age more than 60 to 70 years old, systolic blood pressure of less than 140 mm mercury, female, and high level of spinal block. Insufficient evidence to support. BMI below normal, normal BMI, long procedure duration, large exposed body surface or wound area, long anesthesia duration, diabetes with autonomic dysfunction. Other factors include low ambient room temperature, neonates, burns or trauma patients, significant fluid shifts, existing comorbidities such as peripheral vascular disease, endocrine disorders, pregnancy or open wounds. Patients should be managed as high risk if two or more of the following apply. ASA grade 2 to 5, the higher the grade, the greater the risk, Pre-operative temperature of less than 36 degrees Celsius and pre-operative warming is not possible because of clinical urgency. Combine general and regional anesthesia, major or intermediate surgery, patient at risk of cardiovascular complications, and patients with low BMI. Document and communicate all risk factor assessment findings to all members of the anesthesia team and the surgical team. Instruct the patient or caretaker during pre-op assessment, emphasize on communication and patient empowerment. Patients should be educated about the potential to feel cold in the hospital, provide information to the patient or caretaker, and encourage methods to maintain normal thermia prior to surgery, such as drinking warm liquids, use of blankets, socks, increased clothing, increased room temperature, etc. Encourage patients to communicate thermal discomfort to staff. Pay particular attention to perioperative thermal comfort of patients with communication difficulties. Measure the patient's core body temperature on admission. Transfer the patient to the operation theater only if the patient's core temperature is above 36 degrees Celsius unless clinically urgent. Determine the patient's thermal comfort level. Patients should be encouraged to walk to the theater whenever possible and this increases heat generation. Assess for signs and symptoms of hypothermia, 
such as shivering, pillow erection, cold extremities, etc. Implement passive thermal measures. The ambient room temperature should be kept at or above 24 degrees Celsius. Ambient temperature is the single most critical factor influencing actual heat loss because the temperature gradient determines this rate. Hypothermic patients should receive active warming measures. Preoperative warming. Active warming should be started before operation in hypothermic or high risk patients to reduce the risk of intraoperative or postoperative hypothermia. Pre warming with forced air warming for a minimum of 30 minutes may reduce the risk of subsequent hypothermia and is recommended. Even 10 minutes of warming before induction of anesthesia decreases the risk for inadvertent perioperative hypothermia. For elective surgical patients, they should be normal thermic before transfer to the operation room. For emergency surgical patients, they should be warm as soon as clinically appropriate. Intraoperative recommendations Identify patient risk factors for unintended perioperative hypothermia mentioned in the previous section. Employ frequent intraoperative temperature monitoring every 30 minutes. This includes patients having regional anesthetic techniques. Titrate active warming to effect. Commence induction of anesthesia only if the patient's core temperature is above 36 degrees Celsius unless clinically urgent. Assess for signs and symptoms of hypothermia. Determine patient's thermal comfort level. Document and communicate all risk factor assessment findings to all members of the anesthesia team and surgical team. Limit skin exposure to the low ambient environmental temperature. Active warming. Active warming should be employed for all patients undergoing a total anesthesia time of more than 30 minutes. Hypothermic patients or patients at risk of hypothermia regardless of the length of procedure and patients at increased risk for suffering the complications of hypothermia such as the elderly. Forced air warmer is the recommended device. Set the temperature setting to maximum and adjust to maintain a patient temperature of 36.5 degrees Celsius or more. Forced air warming is superior in preventing IPH when compared to resistive devices. If forced air warming is unsuitable, resistive heating mattress is the recommended alternative. For patients at high risk for inadvertent perioperative hypothermia, both forced air warming and the resistive heating mattress should be used. Alternative active warming measures may maintain normal thermia in addition to forced air warming. For example, Warm intravenous fluids, warm irrigating fluids, circulating water garments, circulating water mattresses, radiant heat, gel pad surface warming, insulated operating table warmers, and resistive heating. All IV fluids should be warmed before administration. Use a continuous fluid warmer incorporated into the giving set. Pre-warmed fluids are as effective if given within 30 minutes of removal from the warming cabinet stored at 39 degrees Celsius. Employ passive warming measures such as HME and blankets. Maintain ambient room temperature at 20 to 25 degrees Celsius based on association of perioperative registered nurses and architectural recommendations. Maintain ambient room temperature more than 21 degrees Celsius while the patient is exposed to reduce heat loss by convection and radiation. Ambient temperature can be reduced for staff comfort after effective active warming of the patient. Ambient temperature in operation theatres are typically kept below 23 degrees Celsius as it is uncomfortable for surgeons to work in warm ORs because of the high level of stress during surgery and because they must wear multiple layers of clothing. Staff may perspire into a surgical incision if the OR is not kept cool, risking infection. Warm ambient temperatures may impair the performance of OR personnel by decreasing vigilance. Aim to maintain body temperature at 36 degrees Celsius unless hypothermia is indicated. Post-operative recommendations Assessment Identify patient risk factors for unintended perioperative hypothermia as mentioned before. Document and communicate all risk factor assessment findings to all members of the anesthesia and surgical team. Measure the patient's core body temperature on admission to the PACU. If normal thermic, continue to measure temperature at least hourly at discharge and as indicated by patient condition. 
if hypothermic, measure temperature at least every 15 minutes until normal thermia is achieved. Determine the patient's thermal comfort level and assess for signs and symptoms of hypothermia. Interventions For the normal thermic patient, take thermal comfort measures such as passive thermal care measures, ambient room temperature set at or above 24 degrees Celsius, assessment of the patient's thermal comfort level on admission, discharge, and more frequently as indicated, monitor for signs and symptoms of hypothermia, measure body temperature if patient's thermal comfort level changes and or signs of hypothermia occurs, active warming measures administered as indicated, measure body temperature prior to discharge. For the hypothermic patient, Initiate active warming measures with thermal comfort measures, such as application of forced air warming systems, employing adjuvant measures such as warm intravenous fluids and humidified warm oxygen. Reassess temperature and thermal comfort level every 15 minutes until normal thermia is achieved. Provide instructions for the patient or caretaker upon discharge. Regarding methods to maintain normal thermia, such as drinking warm liquids, using blankets, socks, increasing clothing, and increased room temperature, etc. The patient should stay in the PACU until core temperature is more than 36 degrees Celsius. Patients should be kept comfortably warm for 24 hours after surgery. Specific Populations Pediatrics Many of the above recommendations are applicable to the pediatric population. Children should be kept warm before anesthesia and should be encouraged to walk to the theatre when possible. Premature infants should be nursed in an incubator. The ambient temperature of the operation theatre should be kept high, for example, more than 26 degrees Celsius. Passive warming measures such as blankets and head caps and active warming measures such as circulating hot water blankets, infrared radiant heaters and convection heaters can be used to treat hypothermia. Continuous temperature monitoring should be used to detect hypothermia and prevent hyperthermia and burns. For pregnant patients, many of the above recommendations are applicable as well. Perioperative hypothermia during caesarean section is uncommon, probably because the mother is in a vasodilated state prior to anesthesia. Women should be encouraged to walk to the theatre when possible. Temperature measurement should be routine. Active and passive warming should be employed as mentioned. Regarding temperature measurement, kindly refer to the video on temperature measurement for further details. These are my references. Thank you.